Today we're doing another what if, diving into one of the craziest historic moments on the court for the Pacers in franchise history, the perfect quarter. What if they didn't miss a shot to end that quarter? We'll break it all down today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the Westside Community News. And today, we're going to do a second what if of August as we continue to dive into some historic stuff this month. This is a fun one today. We're going to look back at the nearly perfect Pacers quarter, 20 for 21 shooting with the only miss coming with just mere seconds left on a Josh McRoberts three-pointer. What if they had accomplished the perfect quarter? How would it have changed? What would have been looked at in history? We'll get into all of that today. If you want to listen to an interview with a player who's on the Pacers about a decade ago, I talked to Shane Whittington, former Pacers center, for about 20 minutes yesterday. If you want to listen to that podcast, that'll be great. And a reminder, for most of August, we are doing four days a week of Locked On Pacers. So no show tomorrow, back Thursday with a guest. And then Friday, we'll be talking about Daniel Tice. So a lot of fun stuff coming on Lockdown Pacers this week. But let's dive in to the perfect quarter. Almost perfect quarter, I should say. One of the craziest quarters ever, quite frankly. Because if you go back to that team, this Pacers team from 2010-2011. Oh, gosh. A miserable time for the Pacers. They hadn't made the playoffs in five seasons. They had just drafted Paul George, but he wasn't even playing in games yet. They were 2-3. and three. They just went 32-30. and 30, Or 32-50. and 50. That team needed some sort of juice, something cool, something to get the fans really involved. And they were playing the Nuggets, Carmelo Anthony's Nuggets. And they were 2-3 and three hosting Melo's Nuggets. They had a great first half, ironically, in this game. Darren Collison, who came back for a second with the Pacers, had 15 points in the first half. They were up 10 going into the second half. But when you're playing Carmelo Anthony's Nuggets, you never know what's going to happen. The Nuggets actually finished this game pretty well. They scored 64 points of their own in the second half. You know, an impressive game. Pacers uh, could could easily have lost this one, except they had the craziest third quarter in franchise history by a mile, the best quarter the Pacers have ever had, one of the best quarters in NBA history, and nearly percentage-wise the best quarter the NBA has ever seen. For those of you who don't know this quarter, the Pacers would go on to shoot 20 for 21, making their first 20 shots in this frame i cataloged all of them but it's not worth going through all of them specifically but a lot of danny granger long twos some nice moves from roy hibbert including a miraculous bounce in on the second shot which we'll talk about in a second and a ton of mike dunleavy mike dunleavy 24 points this quarter for mike dunleavy his highest scoring quarter of his career i wanted to dig in to see other high scoring mike dunleavy quarters like mike dunleavy was good but not a guy that I thought would have a ton of high-scoring quarters. He actually scored more than 15 in one quarter 15 times. That's like a lot of streaky shooting. Kind of a legendary player. He had another 20-point quarter for the Pacers back in 2007 against the Knicks. He actually had some bomb quarters, but this one was his best. Mike Dunleavy, 24 points in this quarter for the Pacers. Seven for seven Uh, from the field, five threes, and got fouled on two different threes because his heat checks were so dangerous that the Nuggets were trying to run him off the line still because he was so on fire. It's nuts to watch Mike Dunleavy cause so much fear to a Nuggets team that ends up getting a flagrant foul. Actually, it was Al Harrington, uh, an ex-Pacer, who got the flagrant foul in this quarter because they were so terrified of Mike Dunleavy continuing to rip off these threes. He was actually the highlight of the quarter. However, calling it a perfect quarter until that last shot, a little misleading. Dunleavy actually missed a free throw about midway through the quarter, as did McRoberts. He actually, on that Al Harrington technical foul, missed two free throws. Regardless, the Pacers made 20 shots in a row. Completely ridiculous. Danny Granger had 11 on mostly long. Kuz Roy Hibbert's second make of the quarter for the team was one of the luckiest bounces I've ever seen. It hit both parts of the inside of the rim, flew out, hit the backboard, and came back in. That should have been the omen that something was about to happen. When that shot somehow went in, there were some nuts ones. Dunleavy was hitting crazy shots. And I think one of my favorite parts of this quarter, if you go back and look at it, and this is something Pacers fans have been blessed with, is that Kristen Aaron and Quinn Buckner have been doing 
the TV play-by-play for forever. And this game over a decade ago, it was them as well. And so you're kind of seeing it ramp up. You know, teams go on runs and hit a lot of shots in a row. So it takes eight. It takes eight shots. Danny Granger hits, I think, a layup. Uh, or no, it was his third long to the quarter. And then Denary, for the first time, realizes they haven't missed yet. He says, oh, they're eight for eight. The Pacers are eight for eight this quarter. I think they're up 20 at that point. So they're clearly going on a run. They're getting away with it. And Denary starts to note it. Then Denlevy starts to get hot. And then Darren Collison hits a mid-ranger. Roy Hibbert hits a hook shot. Roy Hibbert gets an alley-oop. And then Quinn Buckner says, we got some blitzing going on here. The Pacers now approaching a 30-point lead. They still have not missed at that time, I think. They were 14 for 14. Dunleavy misses the free throw right after that. Quinn Buckner line. But then Chris Denary's second note. He's pumped. 15 for 15. They're now up about 30. Dunleavy hits a three. Dunleavy gets fouled, hits three free throws. He hits another three, and it's nuts. This is like the Pacers fans on their feet moment. Dunleavy hits another two. Now everybody's standing. There's about 28 seconds left. Dunleavy has it. Three nuggets. Swarm Mike Dunleavy. you got to watch this footage if you can find it. It's not very hard to find on YouTube. And he dishes to the corner for Brandon Rush, who shoots and hits it. Nuts. 20 for 20. They've now hit 20 in a row. Daenerys screaming. It was great. And then the moment. The moment of the quarter. The moment we'll spend the entire second segment here talking about. Four seconds left in the quarter. Josh McRoberts catches from the left wing. Takes a wide open three. And he missed it. It flies out. Anguish. In Quinn Buckner's voice, a loud groan as it rims out. The crowd also with a loud groan, mostly just because it was a buzzer beater that didn't go in, but also because the Pacers have now missed a jump shot from the field that quarter. 20 for 21, the buzzer sounds. The Pacers are now up a million. They would go on to win that game handily, handily over the Denver Nuggets. Final score of that game was 144 to 113. 144 back then in 2010 with the number of long twos Denny Granger was taking insane. So before we talk about the shot, and what this quarter could have looked like or how it could be remembered. I want to talk about how great this quarter actually was. Because I think that, and rightfully so, a lot of the discussion about the quarter goes to that shot. With four seconds left, it didn't even have to be taken. You know, what would have happened? What? How would we talk about it? That said, still an unbelievable quarter. Only 24 times in NBA history. We're talking 50 years of teams playing four quarter games. 24 times in the history of the league has a team scored 50 points in a quarter. And the Pacers did it. In that quarter, they were the first team to do it since the turn of the century. And this was in 2010, reminder. So it had been 10 years. It, it was not very frequent at this time. In fact, since 2000, there's still only been five of them. And let's go through those five. One of them was the Brooklyn Nets, uh, the Brooklyn Nets. Karis LeVert's big quarter when he had 26 against Boston. They were 15 of 23 from the field. They missed eight shots. They got a 15 free throws, or they made 15 free throws. The Golden State Warriors had a 51-point first quarter. They hit 10 threes. The New York Knicks uh, were victim to a huge 51-point third quarter from the Lakers, who really spread it out in terms of who was hitting them that game. They missed seven shots. They were they hit a bunch of threes and free throws. And then this past season, the Grizzlies had a 55-point third quarter against the Pelicans, and they were just on fire. They hit seven threes, eight free throws, and 20 shots. But they also missed six shots. So of all the games with that I can easily track specific quarters in since the turn of the century. Even the high-scoring over 50-point quarters were not even close to perfect shooting. And they featured a ton more threes and a ton more free throws. This Pacers quarter was not even kind of like that. It was way different. There were many more two-point shot attempts. There were way fewer free throws. And I think that's what kind of makes it cool, is that they're the shot diet, the variety, the way they did it was unlike anything that has kind of been that since. They only took nine threes. They only took nine free throws. They were just cannon twos. They made 12 two-point shots. And I think my favorite stat from this quarter is that the Nuggets actually evened the Pacers in the rebounding department because they got six offensive rebounds. So the Pacers missed one shot the whole quarter, one available defensive rebound in the open floor. They also missed free throws. And the Nuggets got eight rebounds in the quarter, as did the Pacers. So the Pacers' rebounding woes, even in a perfect quarter, cannot be perfect. So the fifth best scoring quarter in NBA history, tons of cool moments, and yet it all comes down and is remembered by one shot that didn't even make it part of the cool quarter. So what if, what if Josh McRoberts, I don't want to use the word ruin, but it's perfect for this phrase, what if Josh McRoberts didn't ruin the perfect quarter? Let's talk about it. Before we do that, really quickly, though, let me tell you guys about betonline.net, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your sports betting needs. You can find all of your favorite sports and events 
at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. That's Bet Online. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf, all over at BetOnline.net, who continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information. Live betting, live in game betting, scores, and podcasts, they've got you covered. Preseason football lines up. Colts play so soon. Five days from me talking, four days from you listening this weekend in Buffalo. The Bills favored by one. I have no idea how betting works or preseason football. But if you're interested in that, betonline.net's got you covered. Head over there today on your computer or your mobile device. To learn more about the trends and the action happening today, sign up at betonline.net because BetOnline is where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, hop on over to Locked On Nuggets. They're probably not talking about a perfect quarter almost that happened against them, but they are the subject matter of half of this game, so they merit some discussion here. And the Nuggets are going to be super interesting next season, and Matt Moore and Adam Morris are two really good podcasters. So we got to talk about the moments of the quarter. Josh McRoberts shoots the three from the left wing to end the quarter. Four seconds left. It does not go in. Now let's talk about the moment leading up to this because – I just clicked on the fourth quarter and scrolled right past it as I tried to set the scene here. Uh, JR, or, or, excuse me, Aaron Aflalo made a free throw with 22.7 seconds left in the quarter. And that was the Nuggets' last possession. Now, 22.7 is actually less than 24. So the shot clock was off for this McRoberts jumper. I think that is important here because you get two tales of how I think this can be talked about. There are two ways to think about what this quarter could have been, how the lore could have been set, and what if it had been differently. So option one, because look, if there's if there was 30 seconds left on a Flalo hit that free throw and the Pacers came down and just didn't shoot, that's lame. That's like protecting a perfect quarter, and that still would have been cool going 20 for 20, but that's lame. Like they're going to shoot. The shot clock being off means I think there's merit to two tales of discussion. Tale one, what if he just doesn't shoot? He just holds it. And tale two, what if he drills it? And they go 21 for 21, and it's still a perfect quarter, and that's how it's remembered today. That, I think, is how I want to talk about this. Now, let me quickly talk about a few other things. First of all, one, McRoberts actually missed a free throw earlier this quarter, but he wasn't the one who made it imperfect. The first miss, air quotes, from the Pacers this quarter was Mike Dunleavy on a free throw. He got fouled on a three, hit the first two, missed the third. That is no longer a perfect quarter to me at that point. McRoberts also had gone to miss free throws in this quarter. So it was already not a perfect quarter before the shot even happened. Context point number one is if when you watch the free throws, you go, oh, that's not as cool. Now, this three, context point number two, wide open. Wide open. No defender within five feet of Josh McRoberts. No defender within five feet of 34% 34% three-point shooter, and 38% that season three-point shooter, Josh McRoberts. Very good NBA shooter. He shot 38% or better both of the next two seasons and had four seasons in his career, over 40%. A good NBA shooter at that time especially, dragged down massively by a few bad years in the middle of his career. This was not one of them. Josh McRoberts was a good shooter. And I'm adding way too much context. From the left wing, from the spot where Josh McRoberts took this three-pointer this season, from the left wing, he went 9 for 18. He hit half of them. There was a 50% chance that this goes in in this quarter is not what if he misses it. But instead, every year, every single year on November 9th, we talk about the perfect quarter. We talk about what it was like watching the Pacers hit 21 shots in a row in a quarter and blow the Nuggets out. So a lot of context clues to me that say, one, because they'd already missed free throws, two, because he was wide effing open, and three, just in the moment, the tension in the stadium. Josh McRoberts absolutely should have taken this shot. He should have taken it. They're 20 for 20. The crowd is up and roaring. The, the Pacers are up by almost 40 points, and the crowd is up on their feet. There's a lady in the front row you can see wave her arm around like a complete lunatic after a Flalo makes a free throw because she knows they have another possession in the perfect quarter. I think if you're in that moment, like you think there's no way you're missing, right? Like, so to me, before we talk about the what if part of this, I absolutely think Josh McRoberts should have taken this shot. He was wide open, and I think there's still a lost part of history here. So, look, a lot of this is sort of a little silliness because it's just one game. It would not have changed the Pacers' fortunes too much. They won the game. It mostly would have just been a historical reference point anyway. So, two lines of thinking. One, 
He doesn't take the shot at all. He looks at the rim. He sees there's four seconds left. He up fakes. He dribbles. The clock expires. And they go 20 for 20. One, we lose the Quinn Buckner groan, which would have been super upsetting. But this quarter would have been 20 for 20. 100% of 20 shots absolutely goes down in history. We talk about that every single November 9th. Holy cow. Remember the Pacers' perfect quarter? They absolutely handed it to the Nuggets. They Mike Dunleavy gets a, a fake day named after him because of that. It's immortalized. And Mike Dunleavy's already kind of a niche legend if you really watched the Pacers back then. But he would even more so be if he had a 24-point quarter in which the Pacers as a team did not miss at all in a win. I think that had they actually gone 20 for 20, it would be even more of uh, a niche kind of thing where, oh, yeah, remember Mike Dunleavy? You know, happens every single year around that time. As that quarter gets remembered, it could be shown on you know a broadcast or on TV every year. Now, line two, and I think this is the much more interesting part of the what if, because to me, again, he absolutely should have taken it. it it's Even when you watch it, like there's – that you wouldn't have thought in a million years he should not take it. Like, it almost would have felt wrong. Even if he didn't have to legally, no one would have blamed him. He absolutely should have taken it. Line two, I think, is the much more interesting line of discussion. Because him not taking it and they go 20 for 20, that's awesome. Like I said, we remember Dunleavy very well in that quarter very well. But it just ends at 20 for 20. If he makes it, if he makes it, the first thing that happens, assuming everything else happens the same, 57-point quarter, and it's perfect, 21 for 21 absolutely is an immortalized quarter. The same things that I just said apply if he makes it, right? Mike Dunleavy is remembered forever. That quarter is remembered forever. That shot, even McRoberts hitting it, would have gotten a fantastic Chris Denary Quinn Buckner reaction that would probably be played on TV broadcast remembering the quarter. Duh, number one. Now, number two, and I think this is the more interesting part of him making the shot because I think if he made it, let's pretend for this line of thinking, he actually makes it, and they have 57 points at the end of the quarter, then what I would be doing as a podcast segment is what if they made the free throws because they had 57 points and went 21 for 21. That's awesome. That's still not the highest scoring quarter ever. Now the highest scoring quarter ever was 50 years ago. The Buffalo Braves scored 58 points in the fourth quarter and they lost. They lost to the Celtics and Dave Cohen's. Now, either way, the Pacers had, he hit this shot. Awesome would always be remembered. 21 for 21 is unbelievable. Still would have been the highest scoring quarter. And I think a lot of the discussion would have then turned to, well, what if McRoberts made both of the free throws after the Al Harrington foul? After the Al Harrington uh, foul that, that led to two technical free throws? Or what if Mike Dunleavy hit his free throw? And then they, they would have had the record for the best quarter ever. The what if would have... If he hit it, I think the what if pivots instead from him mi- missing it, of course, to what if they made their free throw? What if they had hit those shots earlier in the quarter that actually would have made it a perfect quarter? If it actually was a fully perfect quarter, if they made all three of the free throws they missed and ended up going nine for nine from the line that quarter, and this is a lot now of hypothetical, and McRoberts hits this three, they then score 60 in the quarter. And now we're talking. (laughs) Now we're at history, history. Everyone remembers Josh McRoberts for ripping in the three that set the Pacers' best quarter in NBA history up the only 60-point quarter ever scored in an NBA game. And, oh, by the way, to do it, they didn't miss a shot. And, oh, by the way, they hung 150 on Denver that night to win and get to 3-3 three and three for a franchise that desperately needed to ignite their fan base in a terrible time. Oh, yeah, an actually perfect quarter where McRoberts hits that three and Dunleavy and McRoberts hit those free throws. Yeah, that that is the real what-if to me. What if it was actually a perfect quarter and he drilled the three? Because then we'd be talking about this quarter much differently than, well, that was really cool. That was pretty cool. Instead, it's, well, that was, in, that was incredible. That's an unforgettable NBA history moment that is talked about all the time. Now, would it actually change anything for the Pacers season? Probably not. You know, maybe the fans get a little more excited about that one moment. The building goes nuts and a couple people come to more games and maybe they win 38 instead of 37. Or maybe they get a little momentum <laughs> from that game that they could have carried further into the season. For example, they lost their very next game <laughs> to the Houston Rockets. They only scored 99 in that game. And oh, by the way, Mike Dunleavy, fresh off of a 24 point quarter, only at 15, only 15 in the next game, right? Like who knows what kind of momentum shifts they have if they're coming off a game where they have a literally perfect quarter. So I don't know if it would have changed their season at all. It probably doesn't change any sort of history 
for the Pacers besides that one quarter. I just think it would have changed the way November 9th is viewed in franchise history had McRoberts hit this three, but it also could have changed how this quarter was viewed if Mike Dunleavy hit his free throws early in the quarter, if Mike, if Josh McRoberts hit his free throws early in the quarter. So to me, Josh McRoberts 100% did the right thing by taking the three, but I always will think about what if they actually had a perfect quarter and how cool that could have been for the franchise history to talk about. StatMuse tracks quarters by team. It's very, very hard to find quarter data by team. I can find point totals. It's very hard to find shooting percentages. It's very hard to find team quarter data. But player quarter data is a little easier. StatMuse, since uh, they have tracking data since 2014, they have not had a quarter as high as 20 for 21 in terms of shooting percentage. I would wager to say it's the highest, at least since the turn of the century, the highest shooting percentage quarter in the NBA. But I have had trouble researching that specifically to know. And either way, McRoberts make or miss. One of the best quarters in NBA history. And since the turn of the century, since sort of modernized basketball with three-point shooting, with more heliocentric play, for this Pacers team with no absolute dude, you know, Danny Granger was good then, but not the dude. He hadn't been, yeah, he might have been an all-star the year before that. Either way, to not have like a, a dude who could set up and make life easier for everybody to go that crazy was incredible. Now, there's not a lot of ripple effects to go into a third segment here. So what I did instead that I thought was pretty interesting and fun for me, quite frankly, was I found some other crazy anomalous quarters in Pacers NBA history. I think they're very interesting. And some of them are very recent, including one from this past season. Do you know the Pacers' four highest scoring quarters ever? It was like four months ago. I forgot. So let's close out the show today by talking about some very crazy, both good and terrible, Pacers quarters. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day. One of the first quarters we're going to talk about today was against the Cavaliers. So make Lockdown Cavs your second listen today. They talk about Colin Sexton and his still going for agency or Lockdown Nets. To hear about Kevin Durant's secret meeting with Joe Sy, the owner of Brooklyn Nets. So let's, the owner of the Brooklyn Nets, that was bad English. Anyway, let's talk about some crazy quarters in Pacers history, including that quarter that we just obviously dug into heavily. There are some very, very interesting quarters that the Pacers have gone through. And did you know the Pacers have never, outside of the, this game we just spent 20 minutes talking about, scored 50 points in a quarter besides that 54-pointer? That's how rare it is. In franchise history, that was the only one. And all it took to do it was hitting 20 shots in a row. That's how hard scoring 50 and a quarter is. I can't believe Memphis doing it this past season wasn't mega immortalized. Now, there were only one day left in the regular season when that happened. So it makes sense that people sort of glossed over it and wrote it off as a late April basketball game with the playoffs coming up. But that's a crazy feat to accomplish that Memphis did and that the Pacers did 10 years ago, 12 years ago. The next highest Pacers quarter ever, 1994. They scored 49 in a quarter against the Boston Celtics in the fourth quarter. Now, this quarter was wild because the Celtics actually scored 41 points in the exact same quarter. So this was a 90-point quarter of NBA basketball. How many points do you think was scored in the third quarter in total? 31. Pacers lost the third quarter 16-15 to and then won the fourth quarter 49-41. to 90s basketball was so weird, so weird. This is one of the last games of the season for both the Pacers and Celtics. Pacers' leading scorer that night when they went crazy in the fourth quarter was Rick Smits. Rick Smits had a ridiculously good fourth quarter that night. He's had 32 points in the full game, all five Pacers starters in double figures. Reggie had 22. And the Pacers scored 49 and a quarter and only made two threes the entire game. The entire game. I have the NBA has changed. They were living at the free throw line. Reggie hit 11 free throws in this game. Some really ridiculous scoring performances in this one. But again, it's hard to track this. It looks like every player played an even number, like exactly 41 minutes, exactly 37, because tracking data wasn't as good. But 49 points in a quarter at that time when they made two threes the entire game, absolutely crazy. Now, one of the Pacers' next highest scoring quarters ever, 47 points, was their, that is their highest scoring first quarter in franchise history. That was this past season. During that game, it was the first game Tyrese Halliburton played with the franchise. Everybody was psyched. They played in Atlanta with eight guys. They traded Torrey Craig the next day. It was Halliburton's first game with the team. The Pacers scored 47 in the first quarter. I bet all of you remember at least a little bit about that game because everybody was going crazy thinking 
the new era of Pacers basketball is about to be the greatest thing ever. They had 10 threes that quarter. I believe that was a franchise record. See, that's sort of what usually leads to these big quarters. And that's what makes, you know, that 49-point quarter I just talked about from 1994 so crazy. Uh, the Pacers hit 10 threes in their 47-point first. Halliburton had 12 points and one assist that quarter. Buddy Heald had six and five. Five assists for Buddy Heald. They went crazy in that quarter. And then they lost. <laughs> they lost 120-113 to 113 to the Cavaliers. They scored 39 points in the second half after scoring 47 in the first quarter. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty good summary of the 2021-22 Indiana Pacers, is that they have a historic game, totally reignite the fan base in a season in which it's completely lost. And then they lose the game. Anyway, the lowest scoring Pacers quarter of all time, seven points. Seven points. Second quarter against the Clippers, November 10th, 2004. One day on the calendar after when they had their perfect quarter against the Nuggets. Seven points in the second quarter against the Clippers. Their leading score that quarter was Jermaine O'Neal with four points. He made one shot and hit two free throws. Two points for Jamal Tinsley, one point for David Harrison. And that was all of the scoring for the Pacers. They went 2 of 16, missed all their threes, and missed seven free throws. Two for 10 from the free throw line that quarter. You know what's crazy about that Pacers team? That was the 2004-2005 Pacers. But that was pre the day that will not be named (laughs) for the Pacers. That was before that happened. So they had everybody in that game still. That was their fifth game of the season. So J.O.'s playing. Not everybody. Uh, Meta obviously did not play in every game that season, but the Pacers were undefeated heading into that game. And then they lost for the first time, giving up, or or, excuse me, only scoring seven points in a quarter against the Clippers. They lost 68 to 102, and then immediately bounced back the next game and scored 104 and have a bunch of nice quarters. So it's wild how random good teams can have that happen. Uh, Their lowest scoring quarter that they didn't lose for the quarter was against Miami uh, in 2019. Fourth quarter of a game they won 95-88 against the Heat, 11-11. 11 is the fewest points the Pacers have scored in a quarter and not lost the quarter. Bojan Bogdanovic had three. Darren Collison led the way with a balmy four points. Woo, smoking down the nets in that game. But the defense held strong for the Pacers, who only gave up 11 in that quarter. So they were up by seven heading into the fourth. They scored 11 points, and they won. They won the game. So that's pretty interesting. On the flip side, the most points they scored in a quarter and didn't win it was 41. They scored 41 points against the Brooklyn Nets in the third quarter of a game just about a year ago during the COVID uh, the, the COVID season where they played with, with few fans. April 29, 2021, they scored 41 in the third against Brooklyn. And then Brooklyn scored 45, and the Pacers actually lost the quarter. Kevin Durant had 22 in that quarter. And if, for those of you who really have a good memory, you'll remember that ex-Pacer Alize Johnson had a 20-20 and 20 game, 20 points, 21 rebounds against the Pacers. Karis LeVert had 36 that night. He was the guiding force behind the big third quarter. Edmund Sumner had 11 in the quarter, but they lost the quarter because Kevin Durant is one of the best Pacers ever. So I had fun digging in and finding some of these crazy quarters where they score a bunch and lose, they don't score very much and win, or... There's just a lot that happens in between. It's fun to dig into just strange statistical anomalies. They've actually had four different times uh, where they have scored 40 or more points in a quarter and lost the quarter uh, or or worse. That happened in 1979 against the Spurs, 1990 against the Celtics, 1977 against the Knicks, and like I said, 2021 against the Nets. They actually lost all four of those games. They had 40-point quarters in four different games, and they lost every single one. You can find a lot more of that info. Digging into Basketball References, Quarter Finder, for each team. So I hope this what if was interesting. Poor Josh McRoberts, I think, gets a tough rep for that shot <laughs> that he absolutely should have taken. Now, it obviously, him not making it means there's going to be a ton of speculation about what could have happened, how special that date could have been, what could have been immortalized in that moment. But to me, when you're 20 for 20, the entire crowd's on their feet wanting more. They want you to shoot. They want to go nuts. Everybody wants to be excited about something. You have to shoot it, especially when you're wide open, even though – Looking back, it's obviously tough to see it not go in. And a 20 for 21 quarter. But still fantastic to watch. And fun to watch or hear the crescendo of Chris Denary and Quinn Buckner's voice as the quarter continues and as the Pacers just blow the doors off of Carmelo Anthony's Nuggets in a season where they desperately needed some attention and desperately needed to win. And hey, they got it at home. They made the playoffs that year. And despite getting their butts kicked by the Bulls, they won a playoff game. Setting the scene for the PG era where they made the conference finals twice. That quarter did not have much to do with it, but it was still awesome and a fun moment in Pacers history. If you have any requests for the next what if, 
for this series, hit me up on Twitter at T East NBA uh, or this podcast at Locked On Pacers. Try if you can to make it 2000 or later, just because of my age. <laughs> it takes a lot. Not that I don't like doing research, but it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of time to do some of the ones pre 2000. Uh, and they sometimes can't be as interesting when I can't really set the scene or remember it as well. Um, so that would be awesome. But if you don't have any requests, I've got a few more I can load up for this month. Uh, Thursday's our next show. We'll be talking with somebody who kind of worked for the team this season and was on the court with the players quite often. Friday, we're talking about Daniel Tice. Lots of fun stuff coming on Locked On Pictures this week. You won't want to miss it. So thank you all for listening. Have a great day. We'll see you on Thursday. Until then, take care.